This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Welcome, everybody, to Somewhere in the Skies. I'm your host, Ryan Sprague, and today is a very special day here on the show. We're going to be talking to two very important people who are starring on a brand new television series that is premiering on the History Channel on December 12th, and that is History's Greatest Mysteries narrated by Lawrence Fishburne. And within the context of this series, there's going to be a few mini-series. And one of those is about a case near and dear to my heart, as I know it is many of yours as well. And that is Roswell. And it is Roswell First Witness. And with me today is the lead investigator of the show, Ben Smith, who is a former CIA operative, which we will definitely touch on, and also the granddaughter of the first military witness to step foot on the Roswell crash site, and that is Denise Marcel. So guys, welcome to Somewhere in the Skies. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, thank you for having us. Yeah, this is a trip. Thank you, Ryan. This is great. My pleasure. Um, I mean, like I mentioned, and this case is means so much to so many people out there. It's kind of their uh, their gateway drug into the UFO world, and I know it was for me as well. The first book I ever read on UFOs was by nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman, who wrote Crash at Corona. So you know, not only were UFOs supposedly visiting our planet from somewhere else, but they were crashing, and that terrified me as a 12-year-old. So uh, it's been a tailspin for me since there, but um, I'm sure this has been a crazy experience for the both of you as well. So um, I kind of just want to dive into the show and your investigation, Ben, what you guys um, uncovered. We won't give away too much, obviously, but um, Ben, for my audience, you know, I don't think they've really ever seen you before um, or heard from you uh, unless you, you, uh, you've been tapping their phones in your previous life and everything. But I'm just kidding, brother. I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, can you tell us a little about yourself, you know, the work you did with the CIA and yeah, what led you to want to investigate the Roswell case of all things? Yeah, it's a long story. I'll try to keep it short, but uh, my name is Ben Smith I'm from the Pacific Northwest. Um, I joined the CIA out of graduate school uh, to uh, you know, serve my country, to uh, learn about the intelligence process, uh, do my best to you know, prevent terrorist attacks and uh, you know, foreign spy, foreign espionage against our country. Um, I was what's called a case officer for a number of years. A case officer in Hollywood parlance is the undercover field operative. Uh, so I largely worked overseas recruiting and handling sources. Uh, we call them agents or assets to collect intelligence that might be useful to uh, the U.S. government, uh, you know, in preventing terrorist attacks or uh, thwarting uh, espionage against our businesses and governments uh, or uh, weapons of mass destruction, right, uh, global danger. So. Um, I really cut my teeth in the field, dealing with a lot of individuals claiming they had access to pretty fantastic information. You know, it could be somebody approaching me and saying, hey, I, I know where some radioactive material is. Hey, I know there's a terrorist attack coming. Uh, uh, you need to listen to me. And sifting through all of these kinds of people, right, um, who sometimes want to help and sometimes want to hurt me or uh, others uh, and, and getting to the bone, you know, is this really true and is it useful and can uh, we do something about it so i really cut my teeth doing that kind of work uh, for the cia uh, i resigned from the cia a couple of years ago to just pursue other interests one my, my wife now wife uh and two uh to really explore like, really what else is out there uh and to ponder those big questions and one of the first things i i turned my eye to was okay ufos what's this about uh why do people all around the world have these experiences and is there really any there there no, I'd grown up in, uh, oh, this is already too long, sorry. I'd grown up, in, you know, in the 90s with when uh, awesome fiction like uh, The X-Files and, and some of the programming on Unsolved Mysteries kind of captured my imagination and it, and it took off from there. And it's still a passion of mine to figure out like, what is happening? Is, is this a real national security? Is this a real national security threat uh, and global security threat that we need to be serious about? 
Massachusetts. Right. And we know, uh, you know, recently within the past few years that the, uh, the Pentagon has looked at that potential threat of mm -hmm. what UFOs or what they're now coining UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, uh, what they might be and could they pose a potential threat? And I mean, talk about a threat when something crashed in the desert in 1947 that a lot of people, including your grandfather, Denise, uh, couldn't figure out what it was. And this guy was a trained observer. He knew what to look for in the skies. It was his job. Um, so let's kind of um, get your background, Denise. I mean, I'm sure some people uh, recognize you from the show that I was a part of um, in looking at Roswell. But yeah, could you tell us a little about your connection to all of this? Um, even though I kind of spoiled the big part, you are the granddaughter. <laughs> but yeah, surprise everyone. But yeah, tell us a little about yourself. Well, like you said, um, my, my grandfather was uh, Jesse Marcel Sr. Uh, he was a lieutenant colonel when he retired. And he was the first military officer at a crash site in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. And he found that the material was just so intriguing and it just didn't make any sense to him that on his way back to the base, he decided to show the material to my grandfather and, or excuse me, to my father and to my grandmother. And he did say these words to them. He goes, I think what we have here are pieces of a flying saucer. And I, he believed that until the day he passed away that what they found out there in the desert was a flying saucer just because the material just didn't make any sense to him. Right, right. And I mean, the story kind of just unraveled from there. We know about the famous headline that came out in the newspaper, you know, R-A-F, uh, R excuse me, R-A-A-F finds flying disc in desert or something along those lines. I know I, uh, I have it actually right here on my mug. I should probably show that to everyone here. That's um, wonderful. Just... I'm no poser, I promise. This case means a lot to me. But um, let's um, let's talk a little about the investigation, Ben, that you guys did. And it kind of starts with um, with the first episode of the show, which I uh, am very thankful to have been to have screened recently. And uh, you talk about the journal, and this is something some of us have speculated and maybe rumored throughout the years that there could be this this written account or something to do with this in uh, the journals of Jesse Marcel. And um, lo and behold, boom, uh, we won't give away too much, but yeah, tell us a little about what this journal meant to both of you, um, Ben as an investigator and Denise as something tangible and first person from your grandfather. I guess, Ben, let's start with you if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, in the intelligence business, the first thing you want is the best thing you, you can get is is firsthand documentation, right? Whether that's uh, you know the secret the secret plans of the the enemy or uh, the terrorist group or what have you. And here, I had a chance to get my hands on a on a firsthand document belonging to a military member or uh, in the possession of a military member who was the key uh, witness, the, the first witness, uh, government witness on the scene in Roswell in 1947. So there's a lot of importance there. You know, I, when I got a chance to open that book, it really fascinated me. You know, I'm someone who has used uh, subterfuge and, you know, clever, uh, who's used clever techniques to hide sensitive information um, to carry out my own operations. But here I have a book and as soon as I crack it open, I can see already that there's a lot of room uh, and it follows a lot of the, the procedures that I've been trained to use in, in terms of, hiding information potentially so uh that immediately caught my eye and um you know that became the foundation of my investigation can i authenticate the provenance of this document is it a, a real legitimate and what does it tell us so that kind of was the the uh yeah it was the basis for the investigation and really expanded from there um and fortunately i, I got to work with denise all along the way Right. And I mean, the examination and analysis done on the journal is something we won't get into. You have to see it. But um, whew, it packed a punch. I mean, you guys went straight to the top with um, people to analyze the handwriting and um, to possibly decode some stuff that could be a little more mysterious side within the contents mm -hmm. of the journal. But um, Denise, what was it like? Um, 
looking at this and hearing about it as Ben was also investigating it. I mean, I mean, this came straight from your grandfather. Well, you know, the, the journal is, it's a very, it's very intriguing. I guess that's the best word to describe it because what's written in there sort of just doesn't make sense. So with having Ben look at it from a different perspective of, you know, of, of a CIA background, um, it lends to, I think it makes it even a little bit more mysterious because it just, some of it just doesn't make sense. And maybe it was meant to be cryptic and that we weren't supposed to understand what it was saying because it's, it's there's just some odd stuff in it. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's, I'm just really happy that we have somebody taking a, a different look at it, you know, other than our family and having somebody from the CIA actually who has a knowledgeable background about looking at analyzing something that's kind of cryptic. Where right. And we, uh, than what we, you know, it looks like regular, like little poems or something like that. But then it's like, what, why was he writing this? It kind of doesn't make sense. Right. And this was from a standard, you know, provided journal that the military gave to him. So, I mean, that, that lends a lot of credence, too. And, um, yeah, we, uh, we'll we leave the audience to figure out and try to decode some of that stuff, as Ben tried to do as well. But um, I want to move to kind of the core of this investigation, which I have done personally. So many UFO researchers out there, like Stanton Friedman or, or Don Schmidt, who was featured in your, in your show, as well, um, have gone out to the debris site. Now, that's a whole story of its own. There's so many proposed crash sites that people have claimed to go to out there and whatnot. But I mean, Ben, when you were out there, man, it looked very, very similar, as similar as a vast desert can look um, to me as the actual place, which was awesome. So I'd love to hear what was it like, man, for you stepping foot on what po could possibly be where a UFO, no matter what that UFO was or wasn't, where it possibly crashed and was subsequently covered up, which we'll get to. But um, yeah, what was that experience like going out to the, the site? And um, what did you guys do out there? I got to ask, what kind of tools did you bring? This is a very high tech investigation, which we're not used to, which is really exciting. So yeah, let us give us some uh, teases on that. <laughs> if you don't mind. Oh man, it was a thrill to be out there. I'd never been to New Mexico before. Uh, it was my first time, uh, especially to the to the debris field. Um, you know, I'd read about it. I'd read many of the works that you cited by uh, Stan Friedman and um, Don Schmidt and and, and Kevin Randall and all the other great uh, researchers who, who put a lot of work into on, uh, piecing to this puzzle together. But being out there for the there for the first time was pretty incredible. You know, whether or not. Uh, uh, a UFO crash here or not, it really is the genesis of ufology in the United States and a global uh, a, a global culture for uh, UFOs uh, and government conspiracy. And so you have to give it that space, that kind of reverence. It's beautiful. It's desolate. Uh, you know, you, you have to put yourself in the shoes of someone like uh, Jesse Marcel or uh, Mac Brazel to be out on that field and really be alone with this strange debris. And it, and it really takes you there and, and kind of haunts you in a way. Um, yeah. But yeah, we took, we, you know, we tried to give this a really thorough investigation with all the resources. We didn't want to just turn over new leaves and say, oh, this is a potential, uh, potential new lead and not take it, right? We need to follow every lead and, and chase it into the ground uh, and then see what shakes out of it. What evidence can we present? What can we find? Uh, we wanted to change the conversation. And so we brought every tool. I can't give away too much about what kinds of tools, but we brought every tool that we could to the debris field to see if we could find A, any potential debris, B, uh, evidence of a cover-up, and C, uh, and or C, evidence of a, a large-scale cleanup. So, you know, over time, even after 70 years, with the right technology, you can tease out some of those details. So that was our goal uh, in bringing out some of the, the heavy-duty equipment and you know, unprecedented technology to the, to the right. field. Right. And again, that's what I found so refreshing about this. You know, when I did a, uh, a televised investigation as well, you're always hesitant with these things. And Denise, I mean, you've seen and heard it all. If you can't bring something new to the Roswell case, what's the point? And so, you know, we did our best to bring new stuff to the table, as you guys did as well. And um, I think that's amazing that after 70 plus years, we can still look at this case with fresh eyes and hopefully someday 
get an answer that I know, Denise, you have wanted, your father wanted, your grandfather wanted. Um, so it's awesome. I, I think it's so cool that people are still willing to look into this case and, uh, and uncover things as they happen. And um, you did bring up the word cover up. And I would love to touch on that with both of you. Um, I mean, Ben, you know, you know, after looking at this thing, like, there clearly was a cover up of some sort. And I'd like to get your observations on that. But Denise, first, um, what was it like, you know, with your, your grandfather and your father also having touched this debris at one point, um, the cover up and what the military did to your, your father, or um, excuse me, what the military did to your grandfather in all this um, from a personal standpoint? You know, as, as I, this has been a, actually this, this show has been a real journey for me. It's, it's gotten me in touch with um, some of my relatives a lot closer than I was previously that um, actually knew my grandfather, their, their family knew my grandfather and he had talked to them about what he experienced and everything. And from a personal point of view, I just feel like in some respects, the government really let down my grandfather. I mean, he was made to be the fall guy and I think, it was more of a burden on him than what I realized. Uh, I think it affected him. And I know it affected my grandmother too, quite a bit. Um, it, it was just, I think that there was no, I don't know if redemption is the right word for it, but it's just, you know, when you have people calling you names and saying that you're crazy and that you, you don't know what you're talking about, when he knew exactly what he was talking about, and he knew that he was telling the truth, it's hard to live with that. And I just want somehow for my grandfather's name to be really cleared of this because I believe what he found out there was something that wasn't from here. And I think I think it's I think it's time for our government to come out and and, and tell us what exactly did happen out there. Now, Ben, what does that mean to someone like you in the intelligence world um, when it comes to to this, covering things up? I mean, I, there are those out there who argue, yeah, there was probably a really good reason for this to be covered up. And others who say, no, we deserve to know the truth. And and it would be vindication for someone like Jesse Marcel, who, who knew full well this was not a weather balloon, as it's been quoted. So um, for you, what would... What would a cover-up of this level, why do you personally think the government would do this when it comes to the Roswell crash? Well, I, it's important to keep in mind that this is the center of national security in the entire country in 1947. All the most important secrets, all the most important technological developments of the, you know, the World War II and the immediate aftermath happened here in, in New Mexico. So anything that happens here is going to cause rever reverberations across the U.S. government. Now, uh, uh, intelligence services around the world have flimsy and sometimes damaging cover stories uh, to cover their operational requirements or missions, uh, or when disaster happens to uh, sweep things under the rug. Um, I myself have used cover stories uh, in the field, and they're very effective at protecting national security sources and methods. And so I don't, you know, I don't have too, many, I don't have a bone to pick with the government for covering up whatever crashed out there because obviously it was important whether we go with the mobile explanation that this was a an listening device for soviet atomic testing or whether it's an, an alien spacecraft or some other experimental craft uh, there's a good reason to have a cover story uh, but that comes at a cost and here it come it came at you know jesse marcel's uh, immediate health and, and the health of his family members and, and his grandchildren as well are still dealing with the, the, the outs or the cost of of this cover-up, why the government decided to lead with, if it's not real, if it's not a UFO crash, why would the government decide to lead with an alien, uh, a UFO crash cover story? That to me sounds explosive, counter counterproductive, because it would draw more attention to whatever crashed out there. So there's some lingering questions. If, if that was your go-to response, it wasn't a very good one, and it certainly wasn't effective, because here, seven years later, we're still dealing with the aftermath. Uh, and, uh, you know, to my mind, the government still hasn't con uh, convincingly come out with a, with a credible explanation of what really crashed there. So there are a lot of questions. And I, I come at this as a, a neutral ufologist. 
I haven't had any um, uh, close encounters of my own. Uh, I have spent a lot of time working or talking to individuals who have, uh, but I, I think it's definitely a possibility. And as long as it's a possibility, we need to take it seriously. So that's the lens that I view this at. I haven't um, arrived to any decisive conclusion yet about what happens there, but I know that there are still lies being told. And uh, how do we get to the truth of that? I think by continuing to investigate and uh, continually to pressure uh, our government to respond effectively. Right. And I think, you know, data and evidence is the strongest thing we can have. And it's good to see that's still happening. We, at this point, we have third, fourth hand stories that we cannot verify or fact check. I mean, Unfortunately, many of the first-hand witnesses are gone at this point. Mm -hmm. So all we really have to rely on is um, strong witness testimony and uh, the data. And, I mean, this reverberated throughout not just your family, Denise, but, I mean, so many in the town as well were told to keep silent, were threatened. Uh, Mac Brazel, the rancher who found the original debris, I mean, this ruined this guy's life from what I was told. I mean, he became depressed and kind of an alcoholic after that. And like you said, Ben, this has real world effects on the people involved. And I think your show really touches on that human aspect to it as well in bringing in all of the children and um, once children, I should say, right, Denise? And um, <laughs> I mean, it's such a powerful case. And the fact that we can still look at it, I keep saying this is uh, incredible. Um, so kind of wrapping up specifics of the the um, the first episode that I saw. We won't get too deep into it. Again, we want people to figure it out for themselves. But there's also been rumors that there was wreckage possibly stored somewhere else. Someone had their hands on this, and it's been hiding for years. I've heard it. Don Schmidt, everyone involved with this case has heard this at one point or another, but nobody has been able to find it. So I have to ask, is this something that you guys are looking into and um, what can we expect on the front of uh, possible records still being out there somewhere? I mean, I personally think that there's, I mean, something came down in the desert. So there's gotta be a trail of that stuff somewhere. Somebody has got to have a piece of it somewhere. And I think it's very important that we try to find out where this is and, and uh, bring it to light and examine it and have it studied. Yeah. What do you yeah, think, Ben? I, I, well, I, first, I'd like to kind of pick a bone with Don Schmidt. And I've done this to him to his face, and I, maybe we'll have this discussion next week at Alien Con. But he makes a lot of editorial assumptions in his research. Somebody knocked on the door and demanded the uh, the materials, right? Uh, Mac Brazel, Bill Brazel, a number of townspeople who said they had a piece uh, was confiscated by unknown people at the door. And my one point that I would like to raise in this investigation is – well, do we know who they are? They didn't identify themselves. And if this really is a UFO crash, every government in the world is going to want a piece of this. So those with operatives in the United States at the time, and there were, we know that there were in New Mexico, uh, providing information to the Soviets, may have also been impersonating government personnel to get a piece of this. Uh, so if we don't have it here, we need to broaden our scope and really challenge, um, you know, who, who, which government <laughs> might have a piece of this and do our best to, to track that down because it's still an open question. And like, I agree with Denise 100% that um, there's, there is a piece of this aircraft or uh, there is a piece of this craft somewhere. Uh, and that's a key part of, in kind of solidifying for me personally in, in deciding or making my best guess what happens. I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm, I'm still in search of that evidence. Uh, we have some real good leads uh, at the end of season one. And, um, and, you know, the journey is not over as far as I'm concerned, but it's a it's convincing and we, and we give it the due diligence, the, the, the rigorous analysis that it deserves. Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, again, this is that carrot being dangled in front of us for 70 plus years. So, I mean, I guess kind of bringing it to current day, um, UFOs are kind of in the mainstream, like never before New York times, Washington post, um, you know, various other news outlets around the world are covering this topic in a way they never really have before. You're not hearing the X-Files music played behind news broadcasts or, uh, you know, the side-eyed glances and, and giggles. This is serious stuff. And uh, our Pentagon created a task force to now look into it after being kind of um, forced in a corner to admit they had been secretly 
investigating UFOs for, you know, eight plus years within the Pentagon. So I'd love to get your, your guys' thoughts on that. Um, what does your show on the Roswell case and bringing forth all this new evidence, what does it mean for the world today when it comes to the entire UFO question? And I guess kind of how this topic has been perceived throughout the years with a lot of stigma. Um, whoever wants to jump in with that. Well, I just, I think it's personally, I think it's being more well accepted today because it is more in the mainstream. Um, I think that, I think it's just because there's, I don't know. I, I always, you know, it, it, our national security is involved here too. So I think that we do need to know if, if we're being monitored or being watched from something that isn't from here, we should know that. And I, I think that as a citizen of Earth, I, I want to know if we're being visited. I mean, after all, that is one of the biggest questions we can ask ourselves is, are, are we alone? I mean, I don't know of a bigger question that we can ask ourselves. And I think that I'm just I'm just happy that it is coming out in the, more in the mainstream media. I'm glad that the Pentagon is coming forth with showing us stuff that, yes, that they have been, there was a task force uh, involved in this. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, if uh, if if all comes to light someday, maybe we'll finally get those lost files on Roswell. But Ben, what do you think about this kind of new world we're living in with the UFO topic? I mean, I I was afraid to talk about this with my friends for so many years that I was into this stuff. I, uh, I lost so many second dates after saying I was a UFO researcher. Um, but things are changing, man. They are changing all over the world with this. So um, yeah, what do you think um, your show has to contribute to the overall conversation that we're having today about UFOs? Well, you, I'm, I'm continually surprised by the positive feedback I get from people across all spectrums who are curious about UFOs, who are reasonable, intelligent, educated people who, who have ideas about what is happening in our skies that uh, I, I think deserves more uh, credibility and more uh, more excitement about, honestly. These are questions that we should be pondering and preparing for. Uh, but I think it's exciting. You know, the, the U.S. government had denied these programs for a long time to come out and say uh, that it is seriously researching and putting together taxpayer dollars to, uh, to investigate these topics. Uh, really, really will do wonders for the field, but also I think they should be open to, you know, citizen engagement, right? We see that um, the NASA is doing it now with amateur data scientists sifting through, you know, mountains of terabytes for, uh, you know, exoplanets and, and anomalies in space to, to find out. And, and I think the citizens could be a force multiplier for the Pentagon and for the intelligence community. Uh, probably a lot of bad apples and bad information, white noise, but also in there are some credible sightings, some credible details that could be the key to uh, really figuring out what what is that craft in that video or what did that person see or why do we have this activity over this certain part of our country um could do wonders for the moving the uh, the research forward right and i think what kind of sets apart what's happened today from something like roswell in 47 is the government and the military didn't really know how to deal with this back then and you know um it's almost understandable that they would try to keep a lot of it under wraps if they didn't know what it was or what was going on. Whereas today, like you mentioned, we have like citizen astronomers and just people sitting at home sifting, like you said, through data. And that goes for the UFO field as well. Some of the most tenacious people out there are in like in the shadows, never, you know, they're not on television. They're not on podcasts. They're not in the mainstream media um, touting things. They're doing hard research and really making headway. And I mean, there's new companies coming out. There's one we just started, the Debrief, um, where we cover defense and technology. And I mean, we broke a story yesterday about two of the reports that were leaked within the intelligence communities um, about what they're looking into in the current Pentagon task force. So again, you know, whether I don't know your thoughts on stuff like that, then we were not the ones to find it. It was provided to us by intelligence leaks. Um, that's a whole other story. But, um, kind of, I guess, wrapping that up, Ben, what is it like as a former intelligence officer? What are your, um, your colleagues, former colleagues, your friends, your family, what do they think about you now looking at Roswell? I had to ask and put you on the spot about that. 
you know, it re- runs the gamut. Some uh, intelligence colleagues, community IC colleagues, are just wondering why. What am I doing? Because it's not on the it's not on the, the register of, of the spectrum of threats that they deal with right now, and to some degree. Uh, and others like, hey, run with it, man. You're always weird. <laughs> do you do you? So if the feedback runs the gamut, uh, but uh, and I that was a, a professional question I had to ask myself, like, what damage am I doing to my credibility by entering this space? And I, you know, I just thought it's it's important enough, it's interesting enough, uh, the the wonder, the possibility of intelligent life out there uh, was enough to overcome those reservations and and just dive right in. You know, this is um, I think the field needs a voice like mine to really sift through and make sense of some of what we're seeing on the national security perspective. Can we rule out uh, this event? Maybe it was a training exercise, Re- legitimately. Maybe it's an experimental aircraft, but maybe and possibly it's something else entirely and we need to really own up to that possibility. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that maybe is what kind of keeps us going. And I mean, I'll say this, man, we need more people like you in this field because we've kind of fought against people like yourself and vice versa for so long. And um, I mean, I can't blame either side of that debate, to be honest, it is what it is. But I mean, that transparency within government, I think is something that's really important for the world right now, especially here in America, you know, where a lot of people don't trust the government. They're not even trusting science. And, you know, we won't get into that sort of debate, but it is, it's hard. It's a challenge and it's kind of, um, been gradually happening where we have a mistrust in our government and things like the Roswell cover up are reasons for that until we find out why it was covered up. And like you mentioned, there could be very good reasons for that. So um, kind of wrapping that all up, guys, uh, what can we expect in future episodes of Roswell First Witness? I know we um, we dug into what was going to be in the first one, but anything you could tease for us about what's coming up on the show? Hmm. No, Denise, that's dangerous territory. I'll let you take that. It one. is, I know, and I don't want to get you guys in trouble. Oh, I just you know there's some different people that they've interviewed on the for the show. Um uh, I don't know if I you know, there's a, a gentleman that they interviewed that uh claimed to have known my, my you know, met my grandfather and were discussing pieces of the material. Uh, that was a lead that we followed down. Um, it's very intriguing. I don't want to give anything away about that. Um. <laughs> we'll leave it at that, yeah. <laughs> I'll add to that and say that, um, you know, if there's, if there's an, an important piece of evidence to this story, well, we take a hard look at it and we bring new technology to interrogate it. So you're going to look at some of the established pieces of evidence, whether it's the Ramey photo, whether it's the Marcel uh, you know, some of the Marcel photos or his interviews, uh, we get, we're going to get as uh, investigative as we can and really look for that evidence in those hidden corners uh, and uh, see if we can learn something new. And we do. I feel like we do. Um, the show really, uh, it really is exciting and it carries it through the end. It's worth watching all the way through the end. And uh, I've been on TV before and I can't say that about other shows even I've been involved in, but this is one that I I really feel passionately about, and I think um, I think it's going to be successful. Awesome. I mean, if the first episode was in any indication, I think it really will. It's It opened my eyes to a lot more ways to look at this case, which is, like I said, so refreshing when it comes to the most famous and controversial case of all time. So I can't wait to see what comes next. And before we give the specifics on the show, um, this is always an active investigation, even after the cameras start rolling i know ben you're still looking into this i am denise i know you are as well because you want answers more than any of us for your grandfather especially who deserves that um but uh is there anywhere that people can reach out or connect with either of you if they have any leads or things to follow up with with what you bring forth in in the show i'm not sure ben what do you think I'll have a personal website up. It's not up today, but it will be up soon. Uh, AKA Ben Smith. You can find me there uh, if you have any leads. Um, You know, I want to be a a contributing partner, voice researcher in this uh, investigation going forward. And uh, any leads would be, would be super helpful. Um, And you you can always contact uh, the history channel as well and they can get a hold of us and 
if we convince History Channel, then we can get more money uh, to really investigate these things, which is where a lot of the, uh, the magic happens. But um, it's been a trip regardless. And I think that, like, as you mentioned, as you said, this is just, for me, this is just the starting point of uh, an entire uh, investigation into the UFO phenomenon and uh, based around, you know, the Roswell incident. Yep, it, it all starts at Roswell, and hopefully it'll come full circle sooner than later. But once again, the show is uh, Roswell First Witness. It premieres Saturday, December 12th on the History Channel at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard and Pacific. So everyone, please go check out the show. I can't wait to see what comes next. And Ben and Denise, I have to thank you so much for joining me today on Somewhere in the Skies. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you, Ryan. It's a treat. It's a pleasure.